Welcome. Today, we're very pleased to have um, Professor Susie Imber here. So Susie is a planetary scientist and pro-chancellor at the University of Leicester. Her research focuses on the impact of the solar wind on magnetized planets, in particular the Earth and Mercury. And Susie is also co-investigator on the X-ray spectrometer on Bepi Colombo, which is due to arrive at Mercury in 2025. Susie is also known for her very adventurous nature. She was winner of the BBC's Astronauts TV competition, wrote computer code to identify unclimbed, unnamed Andean mountains, and then went and climbed them. And um, Susie just got back from Antarctica as part of Homeward Bound, an international leadership program designed to train a thousand women who will change the world. Finally, Susie was awarded the Rosalind Franklin Award by the Royal Society in 2021 for her achievements in the field of planetary science, which supported Susie's work in raising the profile of women in STEM. So Susie, I'll hand over to you for the seminar. And um, after the seminar, we can have a bit of questions and discussion. Um, so anyway, I thought I would kind of give an introduction to everyone else's work and a general intro to Mercury's dynamics, because I don't know how many people work directly on Mercury. Um, so a lot of the work I'm going to present is not um, is not work that I've done. And you can see the citations at the bottom if you want more information on these papers. Um, or you can email me afterwards and I can send you a copy of, of the papers that I've been talking about. I thought that'd be a bit more interesting than talk about uh, my very niche work on Mercury. So uh, I like to start with this video, actually, because it just gives us a sense of context. This is actually taken by the Stereo spacecraft. So Earth's orbit looking at the sun and there is Mercury. Can you see my cursor? Actually, I should have asked that before. Can you see my cursor? I don't think you can, can you? Yeah, yeah we can. Oh, you can, cool. There is Mercury, just for a sense of context. Um, so a lot of what I'm talking about is kind of linked a little bit to the fact that Mercury is so close to the sun and experiences really extreme, uh, really extreme dynamics. Um, I always show this slide when I talk to anyone about Mercury, just uh, again, because it has some slightly unusual characteristics, which are, which are kind of interesting. Um, its day is about 59 Earth days, so it rotates incredibly slowly. Uh, its orbit is highly elliptical, so uh, it's about 0.3 to 0.47 AU closest approach and furthest away. So uh, this is interesting because actually the seasons on Mercury are driven by its distance from the sun rather than um, its its angle of rotation like we have at the Earth. Uh, it's in three to two spin orbit resonance. So for every twice it goes around the sun, it has three days. So two years is equal to three days, which is kind of interesting as well. But I won't talk too much about that today. It does impact what we can do with the data that we have back from the mission I'm going to be talking mainly about, but I'm happy to talk with you further if you're interested in that another time. Um, and it sits at seven degree inclination to the ecliptic as well. So Mercury kind of slightly unusual. So exploring Mercury, there have been a few flybys in the 70s and then one major mission so far. And that I'm going to be showing data from that mission, which is called Messenger. Uh, it launched in 2004 and it got to Mercury in 2011 and it was there for about four Earth years. As ever, and I'll talk about this a bit more when we get on to talking about Bepi Colombo, it's a difficult journey. It's a long journey, um, seven years, and it includes many planetary flybys. So Messenger had the Earth once, Venus twice and Mercury three times. Um, like I said, it's a bit of a tortuous journey. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why it took so long to get an orbiter um, to, to return after the flybys. So the Messenger spacecraft itself, um, I'm going to be talking, uh, using data from a few of the instruments on board, and I'll talk a bit more about them when I get to that. But in essence, the, the issue with sending a single mission, uh, a single spacecraft, I'm trying to find my cursor again. Crikey, what is going on with my cursor? Okay, it's vanished. If you look at the right-hand side there, you can see that uh, we had this orbit was selected and this orbit was selected both for thermal considerations and thinking about the science that we wanted to get back. So the orbit was close to the North Pole and far away from the South Pole in this highly elliptical orbit. Um, the orbit processed with time. So we did see, and, and I'll show you a little bit later, we did get sort of full coverage of the planet, but people who were interested in using cameras to look at the surface, for example, got great imagery of the Northern Hemisphere and not great imagery of the Southern Hemisphere. And similarly, those of us who like to study the magnetosphere got some really great data on the magnetic environment in the Southern Hemisphere there, 
but we never saw the northern hemisphere magnetic environment. And so this really was a trade-off. I'm going to try and find my cursor again because that was really handy when I had that and you could see it. But my mouse is really playing up. This is the strangest thing. Okay. Um, the orbit was 12 hours to start with. And then it was lowered to eight hours, but still had the same basic configuration as you can see in the in the image on the right hand side there. And there were six primary science questions that uh, we were going to address, many of them based on not just the flybys, but also observations from the Earth. So, for example, why is Mercury so dense? What is the geologic history of Mercury? the nature of its magnetic field. We knew there was one, but we didn't have great data on exactly what it looked like and what the dynamics were like. What is the structure of the core? What are the unusual materials at Mercury's poles? I should just elaborate slightly on that. The Arecibo radio telescope had been pointed at Mercury in the 1990s, and they had seen areas of bright radar reflection from near the poles. It wasn't clear what was causing that those those portions of the surface that were really reflecting the radio waves back so strongly turned out to be um, solid ice at the bottom of permanently shadowed craters, a bit like on the moon, where we're interested in the cr deep craters near the poles because they contain solid water ice, particularly Shackleton Crater, thinking about a return to the moon. Similarly, Mer Mercury also has um, solid ice at the bottom of the craters, which is kind of crazy because the day side of Mercury is at about 400 degrees and the night side is about minus 180 degrees. So it's crazy to think the solid ice. But anyway, I'm I'm diverting. Um, oh, yes. And six, what volatiles are important at Mercury? So I'm going to really talk to question three and slightly question four um, in this talk. Uh, and I was tempted to talk about these six questions, but there just isn't enough time. So let's continue. Um, so this is a schematic, which is pretty old now, but I like it. I still think it's probably the best schematic that we have for what I'm going to be talking about, which is um, the broader scale magnetosphere. For those of you, I'm sure most people are pretty familiar with the Earth's magnetosphere or other planetary magnetospheres. Um, it, the Mercury shows very similar characteristics to those Um in terms of its shape and the, the difference re and the dynamics, the difference really is the size. So Mercury has a very weak field. And so the planet takes up a lot of the space inside the magnetosphere relative to, say, the Earth. Um, the standoff distance, so the distance from the Earth's surface to the nose of the magnetopause is about 10 Earth radii. At Mercury, on average, that's 1.45 Mercury radii. Where well, one Mercury radius is 2,440 kilometers. So the the magnetopause is very close to the surface of the planet, and that's going to be important. Um, many of you will study many of the things I'm showing on this slide, and you'll recognize flux transfer events, maybe, or flux ropes, or or, or other things that are there, or the, the current systems. Again, we see pretty similar things uh, at Mercury, as it turned out. Just to give you a sense of what the data looks like, um, this is just a normal wander through the magnetosphere with, with Messenger. We're looking on the right-hand side, in the XZ plane, so from the side, we're looking at one of the dashed green orbits there, going from south to north. If I had my cursor, I would show you, but that has disappeared. Um, and so the first thing we do, you can see is, as we move from left to right along the timeline, we see the magnetopause there, it's pretty spiky. We see the southern lobe, which I've labeled in the top panel there, which has, uh, oh, I should say, sorry, Mercury's dipole is the same direction as the Earth's as well. Uh, so we have a uh, negative BX and then you can see we cross the current sheet uh, and we uh, then head towards the northern cusp. Again, just re-emphasizing, we see a long portion of the southern lobe there, which is really nice, but we don't see much of the northern lobe at all, just because of the way that the, the orbits worked out. So you see we cross the plasma sheet almost immediately. We're heading for closest approach. We head over the northern portion of Mercury there. We see the cusp. We see some dynamics that I'll talk about a bit later. We see a big rotation in BZ at the magnetopause. And then we see the bow shock. So that's a pretty clean orbit just to show you the kind of features that we see in the data. The, the other thing that I just want to talk about before I get into some of the really cool science results that we got out of Messenger is that, um, and this is, this is a completely different field to mine, but it's important, Mercury's interior structure is broadly similar, but there are some key differences to note. So I've, I've put the slide together just to kind of give you a comparison. I'm sure the geologists would tear their hair out at my very simplistic picture on the left. Um, but at the Earth, we have obviously our solid inner core, our liquid outer core, our mantle and our crust. 
a mercury we have the same structure but the thing to really notice is that the core extends to about 80 percent of mercury's radius at the earth that's about 50 percent so really there's a lot of core at mercury there's a there's a very large metallic core um, and that's going to be important when we talk about the dynamics a little bit later it's also the answer to why is mercury so dense and what is the interior structure of mercury which are two of the other questions that messenger was trying to address so the first thing to note is that Mercury's magnetic field is offset. It's offset in the north of the planet. So if I just press play here, this is the magnetic equator from a load of uh, messenger passes that you can see the passes in light gray. The dots are, um, are, the, are the planetary magnetic field equator. And you can see that they're offset in the north of the planet by about 20% of the planetary radius. So... This is interesting. This changes things somewhat. Um, when we think about the polar caps, which I'll talk about a little bit later, this introduces interesting asymmetries between the north and the south that, that need to be taken into consideration. And this really was discovered by, by the orbiter. Very difficult to get this information back just from, um, just from the flybys. So the magnetic field, like I said, it's weak, points in the same direction as the Earth, but the whole thing is shifted to the north. So we can find out a little bit more and we can confirm this. This is a paper by Rekha Winslow uh, several years ago now. And she was looking at proton reflection magnetometry. So in essence, she was looking at passes over the cusps. And uh, one of the challenges of Messenger, um, and I didn't put this up earlier actually, is that um, it was three axis stabilized and it had a massive heat shield on one side. And the plasma instrument was pointing kind of down and towards the heat shield. So it doesn't have a full view of, of the plasma. And this is a real challenge. Um, and so doing work with the plasma instrument is, is a little bit tough. But anyway, what Reka did was she was looking at the cusps and she was particularly looking at the pitch angle distribution and she was looking at the loss cones. And she used the loss cones um, and the pitch angle distribution to, to try and analyze what the surface magnetic field strength was. And when she did this, you can see here really big differences between the south and the north. Again, significant asymmetries um, in the magnetic field strength at the point at, which, at, at the surface of the planet, basically, because of this offset field. Oops. Um, I'm going to talk quite a lot about reconnection in this talk, and I'm going to assume that people have a sort of fundamental um idea of reconnection probably some of you have studied reconnection at all sorts of planets in the solar system so i won't introduce that in in huge detail but i really like steve's plot here on the left i use it all the time from a paper again quite a while ago now this is actually the earth system we're looking from the side um and so reconnection at the earth which is what i'm focusing on particularly just to start with here uh is the coupling of the interplanetary magnetic field with the planetary field um, and you can see that it changes the topology of the of the magnetic field. So uh, on the left hand side of this left hand plot, at the day side here of the magnetosphere, again, looking at a slice from the side, you can see that reconnection, these newly reconnected field lines here are these blue ones. They were red, they were closed field lines, they were opened by reconnection, they get dragged into the magnetotail. And this day side reconnection drives a lot of dynamics in the Earth system. And so to start with, when Messenger arrived, we really wanted to understand the drivers of the dynamics at Mercury. And so looking again at similar things, how do we measure the day side reconnection rates? At the Earth, we have loads of instruments. So that's that's great. Still not the easiest of measurements to make, but we can we can do this. Mercury with a single spacecraft, it's it's harder. But just to give you a, a comparison for the work that work I'm going to show you in a second at Mercury, uh, this is a, a, a figure from Scurry and Russell, and I've picked it because I'm going to show you an analogous figure in a minute from Mercury. But really what it's showing you is that when the interplanetary magnetic field is pointing southward, so anti-parallel to the planetary field on the day side, we get the highest reconnection rates. And then as the planet is a planetary, if the interplanetary magnetic field is rotating and is northwards, then we get the lowest reconnection rates. And we have the sort of halfway rectifier, as you can see here, where clock angle uh, is, uh, is so zero clock angle is northward, 180 degrees is southward, and you think of it as like a clock face. So in this plot here from Scurry and Russell, we can see that when the clock angle is most uh, southward, so heading towards 180 degrees, this reconnection rate, which is on the other axis there, is the highest. Uh, and so this is the case at the Earth. Of course, this didn't start with Scurry and Russell. It started with Akasofu and colleagues uh, many decades earlier. 
But the reason I put that plot up is because this is the equivalent plot that was first shown at Mercury. So just back again to the Earth one. And this is Mercury's one here. And so this was done by Gina Debraccio in 2013, again, pretty early on in the messenger mission, only 43 data points here. And she was looking at um, the reconnection rate that she had determined by analyzing the ratio of the magnetic field pointing through or threading through the magnetopause to the magnetopause field. Um, you can see that sort of ratio there on the y-axis. And she was plotting that again against clock angle. So again, zero is northward, 180 is southwards. And on this plot, it, it looks a little bit scattered. So I've made lots of these sort of plots in my life. I call them football plots, where there really isn't a great relationship. Um, similarly here, there's not a great relationship. It's hard to really determine anything from this, but it doesn't look like a half-wave rectifier. So this is the Earth. This is what you might expect if it followed a similar thing. And this is Mercury. So, okay. So then people began to think, actually, maybe there's something else that's dominating the reconnection here. It might not always be the angle between the interplanetary magnetic field and the planetary field. There could be something else. Um, and actually at Mercury, we have a plasma beta, which is very low. Our phone speeds are very high. Um, and so we end up with a plasma deplet depletion layer on the day side of Mercury. Um, and so we think maybe plasma beta might have something to do with the reconnection rate of Mercury. So one of the issues that we've always had with a single spacecraft is that you can't be in two places at once. So you can either measure what's coming in in the solar wind, or you can measure what's going on inside Mercury's magnetosphere, but, but you have to pick. And so when you see something interesting within the magnetosphere, you don't know what the solar wind was doing at the time. So this is a nice paper actually by Matt James, and he was looking at... Um, stability of the solar wind at Mercury's orbit. So, and the reason he split it into perihelion and aphelion is that, as I mentioned, Mercury has this really elliptical orbit. Basically, he was saying, well, if I make a measurement of the solar wind at some point in time, what is the probability that 10 minutes later, it's similar, 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, and so on. And that's the essence of what these plots are showing you. Um, and so that means that we can say, well, actually, if I make a measurement and five minutes later, I'm in the magnetosphere and I see something, the probability is, 80%, let's say, that um, the solar wind is is similar to, to the observation that I made five minutes ago. That was the idea behind this. And he looked at the clock angle as well. So what's the probability that the clock angle has, has shifted significantly in five minutes, in 10 minutes, in 20 minutes, in one hour? And that's really the best we can do with a single spacecraft. Uh, there are other ways to measure the reconnection rate at Mercury, though, and this is a really popular way that I know a number of people have have looked at. Um, these are this is by looking at something called flux transfer events, and these are magnetic structures that are associated with dayside reconnection. They've been studied extensively at the Earth. Many people on this call have looked at them, um, and we see them at Mercury too. So. Um, there's some terrible sketches there for which I apologize profusely, but in essence, they're like bundles of magnetic fields that are formed at reconnection sites and move away from the reconnection sites. Um, and so while it's very rare for us to encounter a reconnection site itself with our spacecraft, especially with a single spacecraft and the resolution of measurements that we have, it's not uncommon to see one of these structures moving past you and use that as an indicator that reconnection has been ongoing. And indeed, a recent paper um, by Sophia actually was looking at tracking these back again to work out where the reconnection site was. But in this case, we're just looking for signs of reconnection. And so to show you what one of those looks like on the right hand side, that is the best possible example um, of one of these things. So you can see it's a very, very clear spike in the magnetic field data, um, very high amplitude and very short durations, higher amplitude than we would expect at the Earth and much, much shorter in terms of its duration. So these are packing quite a punch at Mercury. And the idea was uh, to use these to try to say, well, actually, how many FTEs do we see during northward IMF? How many do we see at southward IMF? Is there a difference? And can that tell us about the um, dependence on clock angle of the reconnection rate? So my poor PhD student looked through many, many, well, the entirety of the messenger for Earth years of data. Uh, and he looked at where the money to pause crossings were and that's what you've got on the top left hand side there and he picked out 1717 of those and then he picked out every F FTE that he could find and at the bottom there what you're looking at is clock angle this is now not not naught to 180 it's it's minus 180 to plus 180 but imagine it as a clock face similarly to before with zero pointing north and 180 pointing south um 
And he's saying, well, on, on what fraction of occurrences do we see FTEs or evidence of dayside reconnection? And so quite clearly what that shows is that for North of IMF, there's not much reconnection and for South of IMF, there's a lot. And actually that's very clear kind of halfway rectifier territory. And this was followed up by Wei Ji Sun uh, a little bit later. He did a very similar study. The top figure there is money to pause crossings versus sheer angle. So he's gone naught to 180. And he was looking at FTE showers, which are just several FTEs in a row. And that's what he's showing in the green. And uh, panel C there is the number of showers observed over the number of money to pause crossings. And again, what you're seeing is that for North of IMF, there's not so much reconnection. South of IMF, you're seeing um, lots more reconnection signatures. So this is evidence that at Mercury, there certainly is a dependence on clock angle. It's not the, the money to pause reconnection rate does not seem to be independent of clock angle in the way that we first assumed when the first studies were published. But uh, Wei Jisun at the bottom right also looked at, at money to achieve the plasma beta, which is another suggestion could, could govern the reconnection rate and also found a weak correlation there too. So um, there's more work to be done here, I think. So another key question that, that was first put forward in the 70s by Slavin and others was, can Mercury's magnetic field stand off the solar wind? So the solar wind in the inner uh, heliosphere is, is, is intense. Um, and, so the, and with Mercury's weak field, can the money to pause always hold off the solar wind or does the solar wind just impact the surface occasionally? Um, and so this is a question that, as I said, has been debated for some time. I want to say it was Slavin and Holzer, maybe in the 70s that, that first thought about this. I could be wrong. Um, there's another complication here, though, which is why I showed a cross section of Mercury's um, interior, which is that Mercury's massive iron core sits uh, just below the surface at, at um, 2000 kilometers radius. And the whole thing is 2440 kilometer radius. So it's close to the surface. And that means that when we have high solar wind pressure, that can drive induction currents in the core. And these induction currents, as you can see on the right hand plot here, they are uh, acting to push back against the solar wind. So when the solar wind pushes really hard, Mercury actually punches back again, which is novel and interesting. So that gives you some sense that, that actually maybe it's not so simple for the solar wind to hit the surface. But then we've also got reconnection and reconnection is stripping away the day side closed field line region. So it's actually quite a quite a complex interplay between the solar wind pushing, Mercury punching back and reconnection stripping away the day side magnetosphere. So there are some really interesting uh, results that have come from from messenger data. I'm just going to highlight some of them looking at, at this problem. Um, this is a paper by Jim Slaven in 2019. And these are cases when we have something called the disappearing dayside magnetosphere. And so if we look at the top left plot, we're in the XZ plane here. The prime just means aberrated for, for, for the solar wind direction uh, velocity. You're going from the day side to the night side on these passes. So you can see the little arrows there. And what you would expect to see is that you would encounter the bow shock and then you'd enter the day side closed field line region. And the field line is pointing northward. So you, you would expect to see some positive BZ in this day side region. If I had a cursor, which I'm still trying to hunt down, I would show you this, but, oh, did I find it? No, this is the strangest thing. Anyway, you'd expect to find on the day side, some northward BZ, and normally we do. And then you encounter the cusp and you go over the cusp and you start heading towards the night side. But in these four examples that you can see here, very clearly, we don't have that happening. And so we've got BZ in the top panel there, panel A, and actually another example is panel C. But let's look at panel A for now. So the first thing that happens is that we encounter the bow shock, which is good. And then we're into the magneto sheath and you can see that things start to get a bit bumpy and a bit turbulent. And then we get to closest approach. But if you look at panel A, we don't get a period of northward BZ between the magneto pause and closest approach. And so we never encountered the day side closed field line region at any point in that pass. And so what that tells us is that the day side closed field line region must be squashed below our altitude. It gives us some bound on the side of the day side closed field line region there, and it must be below where we are, and we aren't very far above the surface. And so these are called disappearing day side magnetosphere events for exactly that reason. And they're interesting because 
um, with the, the way that our orbit is set up, um, it's difficult for us to know if the surface is actually exposed using the magnetic field data, but at least this gives us some bound on that. And so if we look at the left-hand plot here, this is, uh, and again, X versus the uh, square root of Y squared plus Z squared. And uh, so it's in cylindrical coordinates, basically. And what you have plotted on here, and this just takes a little bit of explaining, is two black lines here. One is the location of the planet in the northern hemisphere in this coordinate system, and one is the equivalent for the southern surface. The reason that, that they aren't lying on top of each other is that the magnetic field is shifted to the north and we're in magnetic coordinates. So um, that's what those two black lines are, the, 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 the north and the southern surface, um, where the zero line here, y equals zero, is the magnetic equator. And uh, what you can see is uh, some colored dots on here and some fits. The red is for those four passes where the day side is hugely compressed and we never see it. That's the bow shock is what the red lines are and there's a fit to that. And the blue is the magnetopause um, crossings. The arrows are the normal to the magnetopause as determined um, uh, from, the, from, the, from the crossing. And so what you can see is that um, in, for these particular passes, we encounter the, the magnetopause outside of the northern surface. Obviously, our spacecraft didn't crash. But if you think about if it's symmetric about the magnetic equator, then, then um, the magnetopause would be pushed below the surface in the southern hemisphere. So there's some evidence here that um, we there are occasions when the surface is when the money's pause is pushed below the surface. And on the right hand side, we've got the um, standoff distance from the from the nose of the money to pause on the x-axis versus the solar wind pressure. Um, we'd expect this um, this uh, the 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 dashed gray line here if we include a dipole plus Chapman Ferraro currents or money to pause currents. We'd expect to see this relationship. So when the solar wind dynamic pressure gets higher, the money to sphere pushes back towards the planet. This is just the dipole plus Chapman Ferraro. The dark black line there includes induction, the effects of induction. And so you can see that they're offset here. If we have induction included, then the money to pause is further out than it would be without the induction effect. And if we just look at the left hind blobs here, these are the disappearing day side money to pause events. Um, and uh, you can see that they're way, way to the left of, um, of of those two curves. And that is probably because they are high solar wind pressure, We're looking at uh, 100 to 300 nanopascals, but also the size of the blobs is reconnection rate. And so it's a combination of having high solar wind pressure and a high reconnection rate that stripped away that day side magnetopause. Now, there are some highly compressed magnetosphere events as well, a different list, there's eight of these. They're not entirely disappearing day side. Um, but highly compressed events. They were shown in that Slavin paper and Shinja looked at these in a little bit more detail because he was interested in modeling them. And so this is again, a similar uh, plot to before, although actually looking at that Y axis, I think that should say Y squared plus Z squared square rooted on the, on the Z axis, uh, on the Y axis there, rather than X, I think that should be a Z, but it's in the same cylindrical coordinates as before. So the center of the planet is now in the bottom left. Um, the northern surface is that first, I'm pointing at my screen and you can't see it, I'm sorry, but it's the first curve you can see it's, it's labeled north and the southern surface is labeled south there, again, a solid black line. Uh, these highly compressed events, you can see that they have plotted the money to pause location and the normal to the money to pause in black arrows. Some of them get down to uh, very, very close to the northern surface. And indeed, as before, we would expect the um, the money sphere to be below the surface in the southern hemisphere. Um, the the green line is a standoff distance of 1.03 rm. So this is the distance between the day side equator equatorial planetary surface and the money to pause. Um, the blue line is 1.25. The average at Mercury is 1.45 rm. So these are highly compressed interactions. And Shinja was interested in modeling some of these events. Um, this is uh, a plot of the solar wind pressure again versus standoff distance. The lines are similar to before, so dipole plus Chapman Ferraro, Chapman Ferraro and then dipole plus Chapman Ferraro plus induction. For these highly compressed events, again, 
They sit kind of between the two lines for the most part. These aren't the disappearing ones. These are just highly compressed events. But you can see that there's a real trend where um, if we go to the left-hand side of this left-hand plot, um, the blobs look larger and the blobs are reconnection rate. So this is telling us that an increased reconnection rate is, is driving the magnetopause towards the planet. Um, on the right-hand side, actually, I'm going to explain the right-hand side plot a little bit later. So these are, this is Shinja's simulations. Um, the, the color in the background is the simulation that he did. And the little tube that you can see is the data taken by Messenger. And so the first thing to note, this is for one of these highly compressed magnetosphere simulations. The first thing to note is that the match is extraordinary. Um, the, the data that was taken versus the model, there's a very, very close match there, much closer than I expected. Maybe I'm just slightly cynical sometimes about how accurately these models managed to perform, but this is amazing. He's really done a really fantastic job. Um, and he's included induction in the model. And I'll talk about, about what that shows us in a moment, but I just wanted to put this up and wonder at the match that uh, Shinja has there between the data and, and the model that he ran. And this paper is from 2019, you can look it up for more details. But because he included the effects of induction, um, that means that he can then look at the magnetic perturbations associated with that induction. So we're looking at a slice in the XZ plane here in both panels. Um, the planetary surface is the green circle and the core surface is the sort of inner circle that you can see there. Um, the reason for this is that the core is highly conductive. And so that's the limit to the model. Um, we don't we don't have anything moving about inside the core. And so you can see the magnetic perturbations associated here. As you would expect, we get an increase in the northern uh, com in the, the northern component on the day side, um, which is which is which is pretty strong due to due to this uh, compression. And on the right hand side, you can see the, the currents associated with that. Um, and so uh, this is the same plot as before. But what I wanted to add on is that, that Shinji did a number of different runs, actually, and then incorporated the results onto this plot. So the black blobs, this is now getting a bit confusing, but the black blobs are the same as the data that I showed you before, of these highly compressed magnetosphere events. And the stars are showing you the, um, the expectations from the model runs, which he did, for different pressure conditions. So four different pressures uh, and the the light blue is 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 uh induction then the uh the dark blue is induction with a low shear imf and then he's got high shear imf and then he's got uh without induction and a high shear imf just so you can see the sort of the full range um of of uh, standoff distance versus pressure and how much it depends on all of these different variables it makes it really really complex so I wanted to talk a little bit, moving on from induction, about plasma entry into the magnetosphere. Uh, and so um, to start with, we're going to look at these flux transfer events. And these are, you can see in this schematic, they're labeled at the top there. So these are magnetic structures associated with reconnection. And I'm moving away from a reconnection site down towards the magnetotail. And because we have field lines threading the magnetopores, then uh, we, can have, um, we can have plasma entry into the magnetosphere along these flux tubes. The one of the problems with the magnetic field with the plasma instrument is that its resolution, time resolution is not great. Um, and so you have to be, as I said, a little bit careful when you analyze the data, plus its field of view is a bit constrained. And so what we're looking at here, actually, if I just go back one, these uh, flux transfer events here, um, when you observe them at further out in the magnetosphere, they appear as a spike in the total magnetic field. But as you see, as you get close to their foot point in the cusp, again, I'm pointing and you can't see what I'm pointing at, at the cusp, as you get to the foot point of these, then um, they're actually, they, uh, the total field drops in the center of them. And that's what you can see in the top panel in the black, the black line here. These are called um, cusp filaments. There's lots and lots of plasma that's entering the cusp and depressing the magnetic field there. And that's why we see dips. And in the second uh, row here, you can see scans using FIPS, the plasma instrument. And when the scan nicely aligns with the intersection of one of these events, as you can see right in the center here, we can see that plasma uh, on, the, on, the magnetic, uh, on the magnetic field there. So we know there's plasma entry at this point, but it's difficult for us to do a lot of, a lot of uh, quantifying of this because of the, some of the um, problems with 
the, with the plasma instrument or some of the challenges associated with the plasma instrument. But we can also look at plasma entry elsewhere. So um, there have been a few studies looking at the mantle. This is material that has crossed the money to pause down tail of the planet. There's a nice study by, by Gina in 2015 um, and another study by Jamie Jasinski in, in 2017, looking at this in a bit more detail. Um, this is uh, of interest to us because when Jamie plotted um, the number of times he saw this mantle, so uh, occurrence, frequency of observations of mantle, this is plasma that's crossed the money to pause down tail of the planet, versus uh, the interplanetary magnetic field, BZ, you can see that there's a bias towards negative BZ. So this mantle associated with dayside reconnection is showing a bias again towards negative BZ, again telling us that, that there's, a, there's a clock angle dependence here with, with dayside reconnection. Although I'm certainly not saying that there isn't a plasma beta dependence, but I do think there's a clock angle dependence. And lots of different independent studies are kind of um, are verifying that, which is nice. Um, I wanna talk a little bit now about the global dynamics. So I talked about dayside reconnection, but of course we can't open field lines forever. They must be closed again at some point and they're closed on the night side at the, at the tail reconnection site. Um, often at the Earth, we see a big buildup of flux in of open flux in the Earth's magnetosphere, followed by tail reconnection that closes some of that open field lines, and the open field lines return to the day side at lower latitudes, and that gives us a, a cycle um, of of uh, magnetic field and plasma through the system. We see the same thing at Mercury. Again, tail reconnection can be challenging for us to measure. We only have one spacecraft sitting somewhere in the in the tail. So there's a few ways that we can go about looking at this cycle. This is um, looking at the um, amount of open flux in the magneto tail. So as the flux builds up, and the pressure builds up, magnetic pressure builds up in the lobes of the magneto tail, we see that as an increase in the total B in the tail lobes. So as you pass through the tail lobes, and you can see this data was taken um, in the red portion of the spacecraft trajectory there, the bottom is the XZ plane. So you can see we're in the southern tail lobe here where we spend a lot of time per orbit with Messenger. You can see three uh, increases and decreases in the magnetic field strength there, um, highlighted in green. And this is increases in the magnetic flux content followed by a decrease, um, which is flux building up and then being released again. The time scale for these events relative to the Earth is very short. We're looking at a few minutes relative to an hour, two hours at the Earth. And the amplitude, the amount of change in, in um, magnetic flux content is very high at Mercury too. So the dynamics are extreme and short-lived at Mercury compared to the Earth. So that's looking at the whole thing. We can look individually at the, at the tail reconnection um, observed at Mercury because we do pass through the current sheet every orbit. And so we can, as we encounter the current sheet, we can look at features that we observe there. Again, similarly to the day side, we see magnetic structures associated with reconnection in the magneto tail. And the, the, in the tail, we call these flux ropes, again, associated with reconnection. Um, and we can use these to tell us something about reconnection in the tail. And this is just an example of passing through and observing these wiggles that you can see in the middle of the magnetic field data associated with reconnection. Um, depending on which way these structures are going, that tells us whether the X line is, is towards the planet from us or down tail from us. So what normally happens is that we have a series of flux ropes formed and a number of X lines in the tail, reconnection sites in the tail. One of them will dominate, will chomp through the closed field line region, will start to close open field lines. The reconnection rate will accelerate and, and anything Earth would at that point, will, oh, planet would at that point, will fly towards the planet. Anything tail would will fly down tail. The structures as they pass us look different depending on whether they're going towards the planet or away from the planet. And you can see that at the bottom here. We've got um, some going towards the planet on the left, some going away from the planet on the right, and you can see the difference there. So I looked at this at the Earth many, many, many years ago um, and tried to find out what the average location of the X line was. And so that's the point where statistically you see the same number going tailward as, as planetward. Um, so in the top there, we've got distance down tail where the planet's on the right. Don't know why I did that. Sorry, everybody. Planet should be on the left, I think. But anyway, the planet's on the right in that top left-hand figure. And um, I am showing you, so this is distance down tail. And this is the fraction of events that are going in each direction. So if you're close to the planet, you see loads and loads of red color-coded events. They're coming towards the planet and not many going away from the planet. 
there comes a point where you see the same number going in each direction. And that point is the average location of the X line, which at this point in solar minimum was about 30 RE down tail. I also noticed that my reconnection related events were shifted towards dusk within the Earth's Manita tail. And when a similar uh, analysis was done, really nice study um, on Mercury, it wasn't, you didn't get such a clear result as this. No matter where you are down the tail, you seem to see the same number of planetward and tailward reconnection related events. Um, and they actually seem to be shifted slightly towards dawn rather than dusk. So some interesting differences there. Um, Gang Kai Po looked at the tail in more detail, looking for asymmetries um, and picked out different um, portions of the Manita tail and looked at the structure there. And he found that actually there is a difference uh, in, um, in the current sheet, pre-midnight and post-midnight, actually. And that, that sketch on the right-hand side is a, is a nice summary of that. Um, so things do seem to be shifted, reconnection seems to be shifted towards dawn at Mercury. We also see dipolarization events. These are where we've had a reconnection event in the Manita tail. The Manita tail has been really stretched, has pinched off, and then we get a much more dipolar field line flying towards the planet. And we can see that if we're in the right place. Um, the left-hand plot is worth looking at here. This is uh, looking in the XY plane, so looking down from above. And you can see that most of these dipolarizations are again occurring on the dusk side, uh, sorry, on the dawn side. So again, reconnection related activity on the dawn side of Mercury. And some evidence that there's some flow breaking that happens as these things come in, they break. Um, you can see that because on the left-hand bottom plot, again, no cursor, I'm sorry, you can see um, as you head towards the right of this plot, you're heading towards the planet and the velocity is decreasing. So these things are slowing down as they approach the planet. There's some evidence of flux pile up on the night side of the planet. Um, and you can see on the right hand side that the average shape of these is different. And that's also indicative of flux pile up. So these closed magnetic field lines are piling up um, as they approach the planet. Some of these Dipolarized field lines may hit the planet, and I might talk about that a bit later if I have time. Most of them uh, don't hit the planet. They break at about 900 kilometers altitude um, and head around, di diverted around the planetary field on the night side there. Okay, some particles definitely impact. This is a really nice paper by Simon Lindsay. He was looking at X-rays coming off the night side surface of Mercury. So the middle bottom plot there, you're looking at the night side of the planet. And you can see um, some dashed lines there, the dashed lines of the Manesk equator and the uh, polar caps, average location of the polar cap, which is the open field line region. And the dark is where we're seeing X-rays coming off the night side surface. The top left is like unfolding that basically on the night side. So the middle of that top left plot is, is midnight. So we're seeing uh, X-rays coming off the night side surface, just uh, equatorward of the open closed field line boundary, um, shifted towards dawn. And these, this is electron induced X-ray fluorescence. This is where some particles have been accelerated as the um, dipolarized field line comes towards the planet. Particles fly down and hit the surface um, and they make the surface give off X-rays that we then observe. So this is, this is, uh, this is direct observations using an X-ray spectrometer of particles impacting the surface on the night side associated with the equivalent of Mercury's aurora. We can also try and work out, um, we, we know where the particles hit. Let's let's trace back those field lines and work out where that field line might, um, might pass through the magnetic equator or the equatorial plane on the night side, which is what we've done on the top right-hand side. So just use a magnetic field model to try to say, well, the particles hit here and here, can we trace that back and work out what that field line might have looked like? And again, those field lines are all shifted towards dawn. This is a really nice study um, looking at energetic electrons. And so this is in situ data. This is messenger sitting in the money to tell measuring energetic electrons. And what they did was they said, OK, let's measure the electrons and then let's use a magnetic field model and trace where they might hit the surface. And that's what that bottom plot is on the right hand side. The top plot is where we observe the electrons hit the surface, and the bottom plot is where they expect the electrons to hit based on having observed them in the Manita tail. And so you can see a really nice match there, which makes us confident this is electron-induced X-ray emission. Okay, I then had to, sorry, accelerate slightly at the end there. I'm just gonna use my last couple of minutes to look forwards because things are happening that are exciting that you might wanna be involved with over the next few years. And obviously that thing is Bepi Colombo which is arriving at Mercury in a couple of years. 
The science themes, pretty similar to Messenger. Um, it's not like we've done no work in the intervening time. It's just that the things that we've done have just generated more questions that we need to answer. So similarly, looking at the interior structure, characteristics of the magnetic field, surface processes, um, exosphere, dynamics, etc. It launched from French Guyana in 2018. Um, a small group of us went to go and watch the launch, which was mind blowing. Um, and this is its journey to Mercury. So like before, it takes seven years. Um, it encounters the Earth first. I actually had some really interesting um, press queries because we'd said, oh, a Bepi is coming past the Earth. And everyone said, hang on, Susie, we want to know why you launched it a year ago and it hasn't gone anywhere. Why is it coming past the Earth again? Um, it has gone somewhere, <laughs> um, but we're using the Earth's gravitational field to, to um, slow us down and head us towards Venus. And then we're going to encounter Venus twice. And then we're going to encounter Mercury six times until we finally go into orbit around Mercury. So it's a long, long journey. I'm not going to play you this entire video, but it gives you some sense of the tortuous journey to Mercury. Um, it, we've had some flybys already. The second Venus flyby always makes me laugh because there's not much for us to see there. Um, lots of clouds, but we've had three Mercury flybys now and we've got some great um, images back from those. So far, these are the engineering cameras. They're not the science instruments at this point, but it's still pretty fun to look at. When it gets there, uh, the transfer module, which is the life support system that helped it get there, will separate. Then we're going to end up with two spacecraft. The first thing that will happen is that we will eject the little Japanese spinning spacecraft called Mio. Off it goes. That will be a magnetospheric orbiter. Then we release the sun shield that was protecting that little spacecraft on its journey. And we're left with the European spacecraft there, which will then go into orbit. So we're going to end up with two spacecraft orbiting Mercury. Uh, this graphic is slightly strange, so please forgive the strange green thing that appears. I don't know what that's supposed to be. Um, but we have two spacecraft, one further away, one closer. So that, um, uh, that compromise where we had our single spacecraft that saw the northern surface but not the southern surface, saw the southern magnetosphere and not the northern magnetosphere, we can get around that now because we have one that's close to the planet, looking at the surface all the time, equally in both hemispheres, and one uh, magnetospheric orbiter that's further away. Um, it also means that there'll be times when the Japanese spacecraft will be upstream and the um, European one will be looking at the surface. So we might be able to get some solar wind coming in. Well, we will be able to. What's happening in the solar wind? What's the what's the planetary response, which we didn't we, we couldn't do with a single spacecraft before? my Lego attempt at the uh, at the spacecraft. Uh, that's Emma and I at the Science Museum. The structural thermal model is there. It's massive, just to give you a sense of scale. We built one of the instruments at Leicester, which is uh, called MIX, the Mercury Imaging X-ray Spectrometer. Um, the idea behind this is that um, it looks at X-rays, fluorescent X-rays. So the sun gives off X-rays. They get absorbed by the surface layer of atoms on the day side. And then that layer of atoms gives off an X-ray that we measure the properties of the X-ray tell us the atom. And so the idea behind it is to build up a picture of the composition of the surface of Mercury, uh, which will be quite remarkable. Um, of course, now we know that we also see the aurora, put it in quotes, because it's just, it's slightly different to the Earth's aurora in that we don't see it invisible, we see it in X-rays. Um, we are going to also use this instrument to look at uh, Mercury's aurora as well. So um, it has two purposes now, not just surface composition, but also auroral physics, which is exciting. All right, I'm going to I'm going to stop there um, because I'm really out of time. So uh, thanks for listening, everyone. I hope that gave you kind of an intro into Mercury's dynamics. And in the couple of minutes remaining, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you.